Hey CFC, I'm Patrick, Community Groups Director. If you're checking out CFC for the very first time, we're glad you're joining us. If you have children at home, check out our parent resources on the Community Kids page of our website for weekly videos and activity guides for preschool and elementary age kids. CFC, we are better together. As of this weekend, we have returned to our regular service times for on-site services. Space is still limited, but you can now register to attend. First Saturdays at 6 p.m. outside, as weather allows, through September. Second Sundays at 9 and at 11 a.m. Or you can continue to join us online from home. In addition, Community Kids is open for the 9 and 11 a.m. services and Gen X. For 5th and 6th graders, it's not open for the 11 a.m. Registration opens Tuesdays before the upcoming weekend for our on-site services and kids' ministry. Ladies, registration is now open for the Fall Women's Ministry Bible Study on Deuteronomy, a journey with a faithful one beginning September 29th. Here's Mandy to tell you a little bit more about it. This fall, the Women's Ministry Bible Study, we are going to take a journey with God through the book of Deuteronomy. Why Deuteronomy, you might ask? Well, let me have a few of the ladies on our teaching team tell you what the book has meant to them. Studying Deuteronomy taught me that our response to God's love should be obedience. We get so caught up in trying to control our own circumstances that we forget that He is the one that's in control. In this crazy season that we have all been in in 2020, we need to remember that God and His Word are the only things that never change. I enjoyed studying Deuteronomy because it really is a foundational book that teaches you about God's holiness and faithfulness. And even though aspects of it can be difficult at points, I loved pushing through to really learn who God is and what His heart is for His people. We have several gathering options for you this fall. First, you can choose Tuesday nights where we will gather in person here and we will dive into the Word together in the teaching time and small group discussion. Secondly, throughout the week there will be home gatherings. CFC ladies have chosen to host the Bible study in their homes. The ladies will watch the teaching time and then have a discussion as a group, and some homes will offer childcare. And finally, the study will also be available online. This fall, I am hosting a home gathering. I will be attending a home gathering. I'm doing the study online with a friend. I will be at CFC on Tuesday nights. No matter which option you choose, the Lord is ready to meet with you in the study of His Word and in community with other ladies. You can read more and register at communityfellowship.com. Hey CFC, thanks so much for joining us and tuning in this week for our weekend services. Um, we just hope you're doing well at home. For those of you that have not been able to come out to our in-person services, we're glad that you're still connected online. Uh, if you're new today, my name is Dan. This is my wife, Lauren, and this is Drew and Caleb, and we'll be leading you guys in worship uh, this weekend. I wanted to uh, share a scripture with you as we get into worship today, just about being a new creation. We're going to be uh, singing this uh, this song um, called, uh, what was the what's the first song we're doing today? Well, Beneath the Waters. Yeah. And uh, talks about becoming a new creation and, and, and rising. And this is called, uh, I wanted to pull the scripture out. Second Corinthians says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. So let's celebrate that today. Let's sing about that um, and make just that our heart of worship today as we worship together. Two, three, four.
Well, my name's Jason, and I'm the executive pastor here at CFC. Good to be with you this morning. As some of you know, I've had a 20-year relationship in uh, Ethiopia with various ministries in Ethiopia. My, my family and, and I lived there for four years, and we've led some like nine trips um, from CFC. So I'm a bit of a, a nerd when it comes to Ethiopian history, and I just want to give you a little, a little nerd lesson. How about that? So Ethiopia was not a uh, particularly wonderful place to live uh, if you were a Christian in the 1970s and 80s. Really, following the, the revolution, anyone who was suspected of being against the new Marxist regime, they were typically either shot or uh, thrown in prison. So in southern Ethiopia, there was this guy. He was like an evangelist slash pharmacist, and his name is Waja. And uh, he's well-off, really well-loved, very influential in, in his town. And he's very outspoken about his faith. So, before long, Wadza finds himself being hauled into court and cuffed up. And he's being falsely accused by one of the public officials of um, being counter-revolutionary or being against the government. So, honestly, in an instant, all his possessions are taken away. Um, he's not able to see his family, and he's marched uh, for four days in chains to a hard labor camp. Well, rumor has it, you know, that this Waja guy has some medical training, and so the prison officials tap him to become a medical assistant. They say, hey, why don't you put yourself into good use? Well, really, before long, Waja moves from being a medical assistant to being the lone medical professional. Um, inside that prison. He has keys to the prison, access to all the prisoners, and he goes around sharing the love of Jesus, witnessing, and and starting Bible studies, uh, these like covert Bible studies everywhere. Well, one day, a new group of prisoners makes their way to the the gate, and Waja is is called into the clinic to, uh, to treat or to attend to some of the wounds. Uh, One guy in particular had uh, ulcers on his wrists and his ankles uh, from the shackles and from that four-day walk. When he walks in, he sees that it is the same man that had accused him in that courtroom months before, that this guy had fallen out of favor with the government, and now the power roles, in a sense, had been reversed. So as you can imagine, when, when Waja walks inside the clinic, this guy cringes, like, oh no, oh no. But Wadja just quietly goes up to him, takes his shackles off, begins to clean his wounds, speaks like gentle words to him, kind words to him. And then after a few weeks of treatment like this, the former kind of accuser, he just absolutely breaks down. And he's weeping, and he's asking Waja to forgive him for the way that he had wronged him. And in that moment, Waja forgives his former tormentor. And then together in time, those two actually become allies in the, in the prison, sharing the gospel, sharing the love of Jesus throughout that prison. It's an otherworldly story, right? It's almost like unbelievable. It sounds somewhat made up or upside down, but it but I think you'll agree, that sounds like something that Jesus would do, right? You know, for months we've been talking about uh, the nature of the kingdom of God and our place in that kingdom. Uh, throughout the book of Matthew, Jesus has been blowing the minds of the crowds, the religious elite, his disciples. He's got this new ethic, this new way to live. Like, how should we treat the poor? How should we heal the broken masses? How should we feed stomachs and souls and how do we love across racial boundaries and and so much of this new Jesus way it's 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 culturally upside down and here we are in Matthew 18 and we find another mind-blowing lesson from Jesus on how to live it all starts with this critical question that Peter asks right really relevant for the day Hey, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? 
Now, there's a lot behind that question. It's kind of a loaded question. You know, in, in that day, there was a little bit of a debate among the rabbis, like, how many times should, are we, should we be obligated to forgive? You know, some would say one or two. Um, the leading thought during that day was three, but definitely not four, right? And so Peter, right, from following Jesus, you know, he, he knows some stuff about his master. He knows his master is all about forgiveness, A. B, he knows his master wants his disciples to forgive. And C, that, uh, that he is not bound by, like, cultural norms, right? So he knows these things about Jesus, but still, like, where does he land on the forgiveness question? And so Peter enters into this, like, a little bit of a theological discussion with Jesus. And in asking that question, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? And then what he does is, uh, he anticipates what he thinks Jesus might say. I think he's, I think Peter's a little bit proud of himself. What he does is, He takes the culturally acceptable number, right? Doubles it, and just for a little, and just for fun, adds one more on top. So it's definitely, um, this is more of a Jesus-like answer. Up to seven times, and and it's really interesting. Jesus' response is, no, no, 70 times seven. Now, that's not like a math problem to be worked out. It's a new standard. He's saying to Peter and to us, like, put your score sheet away. The big idea today is that the kingdom of God demands outrageous forgiveness. So to illustrate this new forgiveness standard, what Jesus does is he tells a parable. He tells a story of a servant and a king. And the servant owes the king 10,000 bags of gold, which in today's money is about $6 billion, some would estimate. And it's clearly this unpayable debt. And, and so since the servant can't ever hope to pay, the king, his first response is, uh, you're going to be sold into slavery with your family to repay the debt. But then the servant begs for patience and time. And he's like, he's even being irrational. He's like, I'll pay it back. Just give me time. And then check out verse 27. It says, the servant's master, that king, he took pity on him and he canceled the debt and let him go. You know, at this point, the servant leaves the king's presence, right? And then he goes out and he sees one of his fellow servants who owes him a hundred silver coins, which is like a minuscule amount compared to the debt that had just been forgiven him. He goes up to that guy, chokes him, and yells at him, And in response, we hear the same appeal, like, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But look at this, in verse 30, he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay off the debt. So what happens in this parable? Jesus continues. The the king recalls the servant, the original servant, and he says, uh, you're wicked, man. I canceled all of that debt of yours because you begged me to. Look at this question in verse 33. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And he throws him in prison to be tortured to pay off his original debt. Well, this is like such a wild and like far-fetched story that if you were huddled around Jesus and Jesus' audience... They, I'm serious, they would have been like likely laughing to themselves and, and, and maybe chuckling, just like, what is this guy, an idiot? Like, what did he think was going to happen? Everyone's smirking, kind of shaking their heads. Until the last line, and Jesus just drops this bomb on everybody. Verse 35. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So that last verse, it's like a rhetorical slap in the face. It's all of a sudden, the listeners in that time, they're quickly confronted with a simple fact that they're closer to being the unforgiving servant than they thought they were. So what is Jesus saying? He is saying this, like the kingdom of God, it demands 
outrageous forgiveness. Mm. The key to understanding, really, this parable is to understand that the sin is like a debt. And you may be asking yourselves, like, what? well, wait a minute. Like, why, why would I even want to forgive? Like, why would I want to teach? Why would I want to help anyone? Like, I, it's more fun to, like, teach someone a lesson, isn't it? Like, isn't it? The silent treatment, it's worked for me all my life. Like, why waste our time on jerks, right? Why revisit that pain again? Like, I don't know if it's worth it. But this outrageous forgiveness, it is... It's something that brings reconciliation. This outrageous forgiveness demonstrates the power of the gospel. The outrageous forgiveness, wow, it's an incredible act of faith. And so when you think about the sin as debt and that king as being God and the servant as us, it's a debt that, that we could never repay. It's only because that king for, that forgives that servant that the debt's even paid, Right? And so there's been this reconciliation that happened. God is, the God of the universe, he's in the business of reconciling, of reuniting broken parties, right? And so when he originally forgives the servant, what is he doing? He's, he's making things right. He's settling accounts. He's unfairly reuniting himself to the servant. And later on, what's going to become very, very clear to the disciples and the early church is that Jesus' death and his resurrection, it is the event, the event that abolishes the sin debt and, again, reunites people with God. But wait, <laughs> there's more. You know, that, that, that same outrageous forgiveness, it reconciles people in the church. And all you have to do is look at verses 15 to 17, the dialogue that happens right before the parable. Jesus says this, If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their faults, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. But if they fail to listen to you, if they will not listen, then take one or two others along so that in every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three three witnesses. In other words, what Jesus is doing is he's giving them a recipe for reconciliation, even to the point that if that doesn't work, taking two or three, he's, he's instructing them how they can distance themselves from that person, from that harmful person, in the hopes that they will be restored, that they will later repent and be reconciled. Like, in this, like God, God is in the business of reconciliation, reuniting these, these broken parties. Look again back at the parable, right? What's the tragedy of the parable? It's, it's really simple. Like the, the gift of freedom that was given to that servant, he was unwilling to absorb it sufficiently enough to where it even changed his behavior toward his other servant. In the end, what happens? Unforgiveness hurts the unforgiver. So what are the king's expectations? What? Well, it's very simple. The, the one who has been given mercy should be dispensing mercy. And I know that sounds idealistic. It's, it's easier said than done. And especially when you think that people can be really cruel. Our best friends can betray us. Spouses cheat. Parents abuse like this. There's, there's a lot of pain, I know, represented in this place. And we all wish we could kind of reach back into a painful moment, right, in our memories and just cut it out of our lives. It's very hard to forget. But we don't have to forget in order to forgive. Forgiving, it can be sincere, even when we remember. So, hands down, I think forgiveness is love's toughest work, right? It's love's toughest work. And it, when it seems like it's this impossible task, <laughs> but our God is in the business of doing the impossible. Really, through the gospel. In fact, outrageous forgiveness demonstrates 
the power of the gospel. Remember that, that the king shocks the entire kingdom, right? By taking the financial hit on himself, $6 billion, beyond comprehension. Why does he do this? We're not sure, you know, in, in, this, in the parable. But it's beyond everyone's expectations. And it's beyond the servant's capacity to repay. Ephesians 2 says this, that we were all dead in our sin, in our trespasses, completely paralyzed, unable to pay, unable to make our relationship right with God. And then it's like all about power, right? That God uses his infinite power to do something absolutely unexpected. He removes the shackles of sin. He cleans our wounds, just like Wajah, right? He invites us to walk with him. That is the essence of God's mercy. It's not getting what we deserve. That is, that is such a great use of power. And then Jesus wants us to use our power to settle accounts with others, to reflect that gospel power that is hopefully transforming us. It's, you know, this a concept that's upside down, right? Some might say unrealistic or it's unfair, but I'll tell you, it's beautiful when it's done right. There's this ethicist. His name is Louis Smeeds, and he says this, Forgiveness is God's invention for coming to terms with a world full of people who are unfair and hurt each other deeply. Hmm. If we're being honest, forgiveness is a very unnatural thing. Few people like to push through that kind of pain, right? The bigger the hurt, the longer it takes too, right? Like if like a little girl falls down and skins her knee, it, that's going to heal in a couple of days. But if that same little girl gets hit by a car, it could be a lifetime of recovery from that kind of pain. Hmm. So forgiveness is not a moment. It's not like a conversation. Forgiveness is a, is, it's a process. And Smeeds talks about these like four basic stages of forgiveness. We hurt, we hate, we heal, we move ahead. And in moving ahead, that process can be very messy. In uh, December, 2014, one of our members, Nicole Matthewson, was uh, murdered in her home by two men. And she was a good, she's a good friend of mine and many people here. I made national news uh, when the two men were found and arrested. And uh, I was present at the sentencing of the older one, uh, Thomas Moore. And at, during that sentencing hearing, like friends and family members were given the opportunity to address the court and, you know, to kind of look at this man and to speak to him about specifically who Nicole was and um, the devastation, you know, that, that he had caused around them. And uh, it was a very powerful time. And one of our members, Kara O'Hara, uh, really one of Nicole's best friends, and they were in the same community group. So she was one of the people that ad addressed uh, the court. And I asked her this week, hey, what did your, you know, what did your, forgiveness process look like and so she said it began actually in that courtroom and this is what she said to him I'm going to pray for the desire to forgive you my promise is that at some point I'm going to want to forgive you well eventually Kara was able to write Thomas a letter but guys that took years just to even write a letter, to move through those stages. And here's the essence of what she wrote. Thomas, yes, you hurt me. You took away an incredible person. But yes, there is a, here's hope for you. Your sin is the same as my sin. We're all lost and we all have, all we have is Christ. And then she told him about this Christian renovation company that came in and gutted Nicole's house and completely restored it. And then for her, part of the healing process was like going to the open house. 
And she said this to him in the letter. May your life be restored like her house was restored. I'm finally ready to forgive you, but I'm not expecting you to ask for it. Kara, if she was standing here right now, would say, moving ahead is hard and it's messy and some days are still better than others. December's are really tough months. But Kara has had this revolution of the heart. Do you know what I mean by that? Like a revolution. She told me this. And this is really, I think, proof of this revolution of the heart. She was reflecting, what if, you know, what if Thomas is in heaven one day with Nicole and I? Whew. That'd be amazing, wouldn't it? So how did Kara get to that place to even ask that question, to think that thought? Well, hatred no longer resides in her heart. She's moving through these stages of hurt and hate into healing and moving ahead. And, and she would say again, I'm not there yet but I'm getting there. And I don't really know what it's going to feel like when I get there, but I'm moving ahead. Outrageous forgiveness requires a revolution of the heart. And it's this incredible act of faith. First, faith that God can forgive me, forgive us for our sin when we ask for it. It's a faith that that Jesus understands our pain and he enters into our suffering, right? Forgiveness doesn't mean you have to excuse other people's behavior or smother it or just pretend like it didn't happen. It's, it's a process, actually, a messy process of confronting the hurt, confronting the hatred, entering into it with Jesus in the hopes that you will move in faith, that you will move ahead. I'd say it's also a faith that I can be released from the shackles of bitterness even when full reconciliation is not possible. So this week I was talking to another friend. Uh, she's one of uh, four sisters. And the, um, two of the sisters had manipulated their elderly parents into giving them a larger portion of the estate on their death. And so the two younger sisters were kind of like cheated out of part of the estate. It was like one more punch in a lifetime of pain between like these women. And so uh, it hurt. It hurt with exclamation points. But being a follower of Jesus, she decided like I am not going to succumb or give in to the temptation to hate family has to be more important than money. And so she decided, I will press on toward forgiveness. Is everything better and everything reconciled? Nope. It's still hard. It's still messy. But here's the difference. She is free. The shackles have been released. She's not bound by bitterness. I love what she said to me. Feelings follow after the work of forgiveness has begun. Love that idea. Feelings follow after the work of forgiveness has begun. God forgave us because of what Jesus has done for us, right? But then he obligates us to forgive others because of what Jesus is currently doing in us. To do anything less is just like putting the shackles right back on. To say that like, oh yeah, Jesus, you've forgiven me but I refuse to forgive, it's, it's putting, it's, you're imprisoning yourself in bitterness and hatred. So we're, here we are, a church made up of people, God's people. And we are living in a particularly difficult time, an uncertain time. I want to ask you guys a question just to think about, this is kind of like a thought experiment. How effective do you think our church is going to be in the future? You know, making an impact in Lancaster County. How, how effective do you think we're going to be in sharing the gospel, in welcoming people? How effective are we going to be at loving others if 
we're bound by the invisible shackles of hatred and bitterness toward others. If we're stalled in hurt or we're stalled in hatred, we need to move on toward healing and moving ahead. And guys, this is not just for you. This is not like an individualistic thing. This is for us as a church. Like we have an identity as the body of Christ right here and now in this space and time. And it's very important for us to be collectively moving ahead. So whether that means confronting the hurt, inviting Jesus into your pain and suffering, and then moving toward healing, it's time that we move ahead and we take the next step. So, you know, as I've been talking, I know that a lot of you have a name or names that are popping into your mind, right? For some of you, you're like, I don't want that name back in my mind. You're trying to push it back down again. I, that's not how we move forward. I think it's time we take these, take a few steps here and beginning with some of the names and some of the situations and some of the pain it begins right here, right now. And it's going to begin with a prayer. And then we're going to, from that, we'll move into a time of communion together. God has settled accounts with us. It's time for us to settle accounts with others. So would you close your eyes and pray with me? God, you are the, uh, the king. You are the king of kings. And you are the Lord of Lords. We thank you for forgiving our impossible debt. And we think of these folks and these scenarios that, that have us bound, have us shackled. The frustration, the pain, the memories, the victimization the hatred, the vitriol, like it's a very real thing and they often have names and faces attached to them. God, we pray that you would give us the strength to take the next step to forgive. Even if we can't forgive right now, to at least pray as Kara prayed that, that you would give us the desire to forgive. We know that you have shown us your power that you have given us power through Jesus Christ, this outrageous power to forgive. We want to be a part of that. God, we don't want to be imprisoned by our sin. We don't want to be shackled by our hatred. We ask that you would speak to us, speak to us clearly. We pray that we would sense your presence around us. We pray, God, that you would give us wisdom as we walk with you in this endeavor of forgiveness. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's prepare to take a communion together. You know, we share in the celebration of a beautiful and sacred tradition that really binds us to the ancient followers of Christ. It also binds us to followers of Jesus all around the globe today. Jesus says uh, in the presence of his disciples, this is my body. And so in doing so, he makes our faith explicitly physical. So whether you're sharing in the same space right now or you're sharing a time with us on the same stream, like we come together, we come to the table not as individuals, but as a, as a community. So today, right now, we celebrate because God who is rich in mercy and rich in love, like he sees us dead in our sins and our transgressions and he made us alive in Christ so I want to know if you would pray with me let's bow our heads Lord Jesus we confess that we have sinned against you in our thoughts and in our words and deeds we have 
anxiety about the future. We hate uncertainty, unpredictability. We have failed to love our neighbors. We've, you know, disobeyed your commandments. We ask that you would have mercy on us. Lord Jesus, forgive us for our sins. Cleanse us from our unrighteousness. We want to walk with you. We want to walk in your ways and serve you in grace and love. Amen. So when we come asking for mercy, Christ assures us of his forgiveness. When we come with our struggles, he assures us of his living presence. And when we come with our doubts, he assures us of the flesh and blood reality of his life. We are not alone. And that is just such good news, isn't it? So we're going to share now in the communion. I would ask that you would just take your time to break the bread and kind of get it ready, get it in your hands. So, we remember how Jesus' body, it was broken for us. His suffering, his death on the cross, it was broken for us in order that we could be connected to a right relationship with God. And so, on the night which Jesus was given over to suffering and death through the betrayal of a friend, he took bread, and after he had blessed it and given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, and he said this, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. God, fill us with your holy love and reveal your wisdom to us. We want to know you. Perfect what you have begun and may your Holy Spirit speak to us as we pray. Amen. And now take a moment to prepare the, the cup. Just take it in your hand. Look at it. He took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and saying this, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. So we are members of the body of Christ, and we look forward to this great banquet when he comes again the ushering in of God's coming kingdom. So when we eat this bread and we drink this cup representing the body and blood of Jesus, we will regularly celebrate his death and his resurrection until he comes again. Amen? Amen. One, two, on this journey I get lost in my mistakes It looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength My story isn't over My story's just begun I feel you want to find me If that's what my father does I feel you want to find me Cause that's what my father does
never wanted perfect, you just wanted mine. And the story isn't over, and the story isn't good. This fear is never final. bring us, God, into your fold, into your house, God, and you call us your own. God, and you care for us. God, as your family, God, help us to be a family that just knows what it means to be forgiven and knows what it means, God, to also then forgive others. God, we give you glory in all we do and all we are. Send us into your world to be vehicles of truth and light. In Jesus' name. Thank you for joining us today. Next week, we look forward to gathering Saturday at 6 p.m. outside or Sunday at 9 or 11 a.m. here at CFC. You can also view our services online each Sunday on Facebook at 9 a.m. or at our website, communityfellowship.com. Lastly, if you'd like to support the mission and vision of CFC financially, you can do so on our website or by using our Alexio app. Have a great day. But the